My name is Natalie Mossen. I'm the president of Congress for the UIA World Congress of Architects, which will take place here in Copenhagen in 2023. In 2023, Copenhagen is proud to host the UNESCO UIA World Capital of Architecture. We're also honored to host the UIA World Congress of Architecture. Our theme is sustainable futures leave no one behind. And what does that mean in a Copenhagen context, Camilla? Well, leave no one behind for us is really about all the things that we have in common. We share this earth, we share the resources, and we share the precious space in a city like Copenhagen. So navigating this and compromising in a city, creating affordable spaces that are open to everyone and places that urban spaces that are accessible are really important to us. With the, with the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the UN has defined the complexity uh, of the challenges we face, both humanely and environmentally. If you look at uh, Copenhagen today, where are our biggest challenges? In Copenhagen, some of the biggest challenges are in terms of creating better urban diversity, uh, so more affordable housing and integration for all. But that also, the urban diversity also goes in terms of the other species that populate the planet together with us. So talking about uh, the biodiversity of the city uh, and how uh, na natural features in the city can help to contribute to the quality of life. Another point that we're really interested in is understanding the changes of mobility in the city because there's so much space being used for transportation in our cities and to reach the targets of CO2 neutrality that is really for us one of the key factors that we have to learn more about. I was trained as a modernist. What actually happened with modernism was that all the cities were made up of spaces until modernism. After the modernist redefined, the focus was moved from the spaces to the objects. And then suddenly cities were made up of stacking objects and everything was made from five kilometers up over a model where you moved around. If you have a nice composition, it would be a good place to live. That was my training in the 50s. And later on, um, when I married a psychologist and we saw all this being built, we started to wonder. And all these psychologists, they kept saying, why are you architects not interested in people? Why don't they teach you anything about people in School of Architecture? I was told that it doesn't matter because people will adapt. But this attitude that people will adapt, that was completely nonsense. Because when we started to study, we found that there were so many things where, where the built form influenced the quality of life for people very, very much. Actually, Copenhagen was a little bit of a forerunner because that was the first city in the world where the life of the city was documented as carefully as the traffic in the city. And we can see the results today, now, 50 years later. But one of the things which, had, which was done in Copenhagen was that they decided to do a lot for bicycling. If there are many bicycles in the street, there are people in the street. And there has been a very fantastic upsurge of bicycling in this city. And it's interesting that this kind of policy is perfectly suited to cities all over the world. That's the cheapest you can do. You can do it in Dhaka and in, in Manila and in Lagos, uh, as you can do it here in Copenhagen. One of my ambitions will be to have cities more create for humans with more space for, for people. For example, I would love to see Copenhagen without having all the cars in the city center just be able to move with my bike or walking because the city is for the citizens. We are standing here today uh, at a piece of architecture that your office has uh, created. 
Uh, what was your intention with creating this uh, special place along the coast of Copenhagen? I think the whole idea behind the project was to make something for everybody as a public space that would welcome people of all ages and also to be more inclusive. So I think this is actually my absolutely favorite piece of architecture that we have done uh, over the years. And it's very much welcoming and uh, it's very much for everybody. And I think that's also something that we have to, when we think about the future, to create those places that are for everybody and that architecture can really enable that. Specifically, this is uh, for uh, swimming and bathing and enjoying the ocean. Uh, and it also allows for access, say for instance, uh, if you're wheelchair bound. So I think to have this, when you think about diversity, it's not just about women and, and men of uh, different backgrounds, but also if you have uh, problems, if you're a disabled person. So we need to, everybody has to, to be part of this. And we don't, we can't leave anyone behind. That's also extremely important when we are designing uh, our houses. If you build um, a large nightclub, it doesn't mean that people will for sure come and dance, but it allows for people to dance. It could be a nightclub, as opposed, if, as opposed to if it's like filled with columns and different levels, and then no one's gonna come dance. But just, just because it can accommodate dancing doesn't mean it's gonna happen, but that's the responsibility, to allow for things to happen. You're a researcher here in Denmark, but you're originally from Brazil, so you know the context of, uh, of urban planning both in South America and here in the north. What can we learn from each other? I think we're faced with some of the same challenges. So these are global challenges of you know, biodiversity decline and uh, increase in the emissions of greenhouse gases. And uh, here, for instance, in Denmark and Northern Europe, we are facing an imminent uh, restructuring of, of the agricultural sector and, and this has really serious consequences for land use and uh, the spatial planning of, of, of regions and, and cities and uh, we have to face that as architects and we have to relate to, to this challenge and, and in Brazil we also have some of these challenges with the uh, encroachment of the uh, Amazonian forest with uh, agricultural uses, uh, which has also serious consequences for uh, CO2 emissions and declining biodiversity. As architects, we have a responsibility to contribute to society to solve the challenges, humane and environmental. And today we are in a place in Copenhagen that illustrates that point. Can you tell us a bit about the, the location we are in today? Yeah, actually we are quite in, centrally placed in Copenhagen here. And this particular housing area has a very interesting story. In uh, 1854, there was a big cholera pandemia in the world and in Copenhagen there was a very bad outbreak of this cholera. And uh, Copenhagen was confined by its walls and it was found out of course that the closeness that people are living on top of each other and the high density was really the problem in this epidemic. They took down the walls just after and expanded the city and the doctors of Denmark, they went together to make a model city which would be healthy for people and for poor people. They worked together with some of the best architects in the country and made this 150 years ago. It is still one of the best housing places in, in Copenhagen. It's got a very nice relationship between the common areas and the green areas. And this is an example of how architects could contribute wonderful things given the right programs, and we can also influence the programs, Mike. There needs to be much more cooperation 
from architects to other uh, professions that take care of cities. We need to go hand in hand to create a sustainable future for, for us and for our children. We can do a difference as architects, both in regard to inclusion, to human quality of life, and also in regard to, to nature. What are the greatest challenges you see as we move forward? I think we have a very important mission then, because we need to cut down our gas emissions, really, since we are having almost 40% of the gas emissions is coming from the building industry. So we need to find new solutions. And when we see, when we look uh, ahead in the future, we can also see that people will move into cities and the building stock will increase at the same time. So we need to do something. I think in one way it's interesting to think about new buildings, but I think it's even more interesting to look at the building stock we already have. How, how can we reinvent, how can we transform the buildings that we have already built and how can they be used in different ways. I see a lot of projects at university uh, where we're being trained as architects that uh, are going from the idea, from the abstract idea into the final building. And that's where it ends, to have a building and that's kind of the end of the work of the architect. But architecture should start thinking from idea through building and maintenance to what happens after, to demolition, to reuse. Because we see a lot of buildings today um, that it's quite clear that this hasn't been thought through and we're kind of stuck with them. Um, and I think this is something that, uh, this is a shift in the thinking that could be really, really helpful for future generations. We're meeting here today in a wonderful space in Copenhagen, a square that has been renovated uh, to both uh, improve quality of life for citizens, but also to handle uh, excess rainwater from uh, the increased rainbursts that are a consequence of climate change. I think it's an exemplary project about what you can do in terms of uh, climate adaptation. And, uh, and we have, as architects, we have to really uh, adopt these uh, agendas in terms of climate adaptation, uh, reduction of greenhouse gases, uh, coexistence with uh, different species, uh, both in urban regions but also in cities, and, and how these types of coexistence can really uh, be the source of new thinking and a new paradigm and the development of new strategies for urban development. Technical solutions are already here and we just need to start implementing them. And architecture needs to take this leading role in, in creating this change, enabling us as, as community to, to, to simply survive. The red thread through all this is an interest in Homo sapiens. It's an interest in also in our biological history, in how our senses work, how we are a walking animal and we are very socially oriented. There's nothing more interest in our lives than the other people. And that is evident everywhere on this globe. And this is some very basic things. And I would say also to the young students that uh, use the basic knowledge and actually also go out and watch for yourself how things work and make your own conclusions because that's so strong to see architectural scenes which works very well and other architectural scenes which works completely, which are completely lousy and works very badly. You can learn a lot by using your eyes to see how people respond to architecture and you can use this to make fabulous architecture which is also cheap and which could also be for every group in society.